You've been watching me build a CNC control box and many of you have been asking what kind of machine it's gonna go on. Well, that's what we're gonna look at today. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. And I know, I know, you just want to see the machine. It's over here, let me move the camera. This is an Avid Benchtop Pro CNC machine. This particular one is their 24 by 24 model. The travels are about 26 inches in X and Y and about eight and three quarters, nine inches in Z. You can adjust exactly how it's set up. That's the travel of the axis but I'm gonna have it set up here so that I have about seven and a half inches clearance underneath the gantry, which is enough to come in and clear tools in a rack if I wanna set this up for the automatic tool changer. It will have an automatic tool changer spindle on it, it's just a matter of whether I go to the trouble of actually setting it up to do the automatic tool changes. I never got around to doing that on my G0704 mill, but this is a much better candidate for that. Let's talk a little bit about the machine. This is not your average CNC router. This thing is really heavy. The kit from the factory comes in at about 150 kilos, 330-ish pounds, something like that. And it's assembled out of heavy aluminum extrusion. The rails that connect the axes on the side underneath the bed, it's all 40 series uh, aluminum T-slot extrusion. And these are 80 by 80. There's three of those. There's also an aluminum extrusion you can't see on the back side of the x-axis up here, and that's 80 by 160. These side support plates are, you know, they're a little less than an inch thick. These are solid aluminum, and they're held on each end with eight M8 screws and located on dowels. The axes themselves are driven by ball screws. Um, they're 16 millimeter ball screws, I believe. And it, there's also, it's running on two ball bearing linear rails per axis. So each axis has got two uh, linear rails. Uh, they look to me about 15 millimeters. I don't know what the standard sizes are, but there's two of those and four bearing blocks on each axis. So this thing is really heavy and really rigid. So as a router, it should be capable of doing a lot of the same kind of work that I've been doing on my G0704 mill. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this is at least as rigid or more rigid than my benchtop mill. But only time is gonna tell. They specify it for cutting non-ferrous materials like aluminum. Uh, of course, it'll handle you know wood and particle board and any of those things you'd wanna cut. I don't know why you'd wanna make a mess like that. But um, so it's specified for aluminum but I am probably going to push it and see if we can make it cut steel as well. Now you may have noticed these fixture plates. The machine does not come with these fixture plates. What it comes with is uh, aluminum extrusion. I believe this is 80 by mm, 15 or 20 millimeter uh, T-slot that you bolt down. It comes with a whole bunch of pieces that go across and give you T-slots to either attach a spoil board or attach your work directly. And I, since I'm gonna be using this primarily as a mill for machining aluminum, I opted to go with a more versatile hold down system. It's gonna make it a lot more like a CNC mill. These fixture plates are made by Saunders Machine Works and they make a kit specifically for this router. These are 950 thou thick, so they're about an inch thick. Was that 24 millimeters thick? And they have a set of half 13 holes with a top section that's bored out to accept a uh, half inch dowel pin. So this is a precision locating surface with precision bores for locating fixtures and half 13 holes for attaching the work down to the, to the surface. Now this is not, I mean you could treat it as a sacrificial surface if you're made out of money, but this is not intended to be a sacrificial surface, this is intended to be a fixture plate to hold various work holding solutions. And the work holding that I'm gonna start with are the Saunders Machine Works uh, modular vise system. I actually got two of their four inch mod vices and these have diamond locating pins. So they locate precisely into the fixture plate. You have the two halves of the vise and then they clamp down on the work. And you can set up as many of these as you want, as many as you need in whatever pattern you want. These take uh, Mighty Bite 
talon grips or there are soft jaws for these. There's a whole bunch of different work holding solutions. But just with these modular vices, if they're set all the way out on the extreme ends of the plates, with the fixed jaw on one end and the clamping jaw on the other, total clamping distance between the jaws is 21 inches. And then of course you can run these, you can gang these in parallel across to hold larger work pieces. Um, you can use you know, jack screws in the, in the various fixture holes and do you know, pretty much anything that you want, including setting up a large job with a whole bunch of clamps so that you can machine a full bed of parts all at once. You can probably see these uh, little red uh, inserts here. When you run something like this on a mill and you're gonna have coolant and chips going everywhere, these holes are gonna get pretty gnarly pretty fast. So there are plugs that you can put in the holes that you're not using so that they don't fill up with junk. And uh, you can buy them. I opted to 3D print them. We'll probably look at those in a future video. But there are over 700 holes on these plates. So it's a considerable job. The printer's going right now. I can get 70 at a time, and uh, I've been churning them out for the last couple of days. Now, I'm not gonna do a step-by-step -step assembly video for the machine. The instructions from Avid are quite good, and there are videos out there, both from Avid and from other people, showing how this thing goes together. So I'm just gonna assume that if you're interested in one of these, you can figure that out. It doesn't make sense for me to do that again. I will mention a few things about it. It went together pretty well with a couple of exceptions. The two axes for the Y are identical, and then the axis for X on the gantry is a little bit different because the axes for X and Y are drilled to accept the cross members, and the gantry axis is drilled to bolt onto the aluminum extrusion for the gantry. Somehow, I ended up with two gantry axes and one side axis. And that's not technically true. The second gantry axis actually had the plate with the locating pins uh, that would have been a side axis, except it was drilled, so it was built on the extrusion for the gantry. And so I contacted Avid, and they looked at my photos, figured out what had happened, and immediately shipped me a new axis, and I had it in a few days. Now, when I actually went to put it together, I discovered that that new axis had actually been damaged in shipping. And in fact, the ear on the front corner had been hit and was actually bent. Uh, that new axis was also missing. There are some little uh, slick plastic inserts that glide along and guide the uh, dust covers, and those were also missing. However, since I had not sent back the wrong axis that they had sent me, I was able to scavenge all the parts I needed off of that. So I've just swapped that out. Everything else went together nice and smooth. I'm pretty happy with it so far. Obviously, I don't have it running under power yet, but we will get that going today. I did notice that there are some tight spots in the Z axis even when I just turn the ball screw by hand. I can't tell if there's a little bit of bend in the ball screw, which is not that uncommon, uh, that can be straightened, or if there's just a misalignment and I need to loosen some things up, realign it, and retighten it. I'm sure if there's actually a problem, they'll take care of it, but um, I'm also sure it's probably something that I can, that I can sort out. Now there's still gonna be a bunch of work to align this. This is all just bolted together, and so the squareness is not necessarily perfect. The bed is not necessarily level or parallel to the axes. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm probably gonna need to do. I actually don't have the tools here today to do that, um, but we will be doing a video in the future of aligning everything as closely as possible. If this were just a router and I was just gonna be uh, you know, V-groove cutting signs and uh, cutting out wooden objects in kind of two and a half D machining, I wouldn't worry about it that much. But since I plan to use this as a CNC mill, we will spend a bunch of time going through it and actually aligning everything and trying to get it just as perfect as we can. Uh, how good will that be? I don't know yet, but we're gonna give it our best shot and we're gonna find out. These are the motors that I plan to use. This is a NEMA 34 clear path integrated servo. I showed these in the bench test video last week and now it's time to actually put them on the machine. Now they go together with a misalignment coupler. 
and the other half is already assembled in here. Let me see if I can get the insert out without dropping it down inside. And these have a plastic insert that fits on here and can slide back and forth. And it fits on the other half of the coupler that's inside the axis, so it can slide the other way. So if you have a little bit of misalignment, this part will just slide, but you get continuous smooth angular motion and you can tolerate a little bit of misalignment. So these just go on the motor shaft and then the motor mounts onto the motor flange. Now this motor mounting flange has a register to capture a NEMA 34 motor and it also has a recess that will capture a NEMA 23. And they sell electronic kits with NEMA 23 steppers and NEMA 34 steppers. I don't wanna mess around with steppers, which is why I'm going with the servos, which means I need to make these work. The problem is the holes for the NEMA 34 mount here are threaded M6, and the holes in a standard NEMA 34 motor, including this clear path, are five millimeter. Now this puzzled me for a little while, but uh, I did a little bit of research, and the NEMA 34 motors that they include in their electronic kits do indeed have six and a half or 6.4 millimeter holes in them. The clear path does not. And as far as I can tell, the NEMA standard is for a five or like a 5.4 or five and a half millimeter hole. So we've got to figure out how to make a six millimeter screw fit in a five millimeter hole. I could drill these out, but these motors are north of $500 a piece. I really don't want to drill them. I could make new motor plates. I don't really want to do that. There's not really room here to drill these out and put in threaded inserts. So I think what I'm gonna do is make some studs that are threaded M6 on one end and M5 on the other. Let's go over to the lathe and make them. So what I ultimately need to do is make some studs that have an M6 thread on one end and an M5 thread on the other. So I just bought some M6 studs and we'll uh, put these in a collet here in the lathe and turn down the other end and put an M5 thread on it. Now to make this easier, I have a depth stop set up on the collet. And the depth stop just uses the inside threads on the 5C collet and it has a rod. This one's made by Edge Technology, but I mean, you even make these in the shop. And all it is is just an adjustable rod. There's a clamping screw here, and these come in different diameters depending on what you need to register and how big the collet is. Uh, in this case, it's a six millimeter collet. And this just threads in and gives me something to position the stud against. So I can just take the stud, press it in, and every one that I push in ends up at the same depth. And that allows me to set up a dial indicator on the lathe so that I can make these repeatedly. Now this would be really nice if I had a lever collet closer. That's where they really come into their own, is on a job like this. But I can just push that in. Now since I am gripping on the top of the threads and I am gonna be threading this, uh, I do need that to grip pretty well. So I've got the collet a little bit tighter than maybe it would absolutely have to be otherwise. And then I will turn it down using a carbide tool here. And this one is a uh, high positive angle tool that's intended for aluminum. But on a small lathe like this, it works great on mild steel. slow it down, put a little chamfer on it before threading. Maybe not that far. Then I could single point these threads, but don't want to, so I will bring in the tailstock die holder, and this has just got an M5 die in it. 
I did start out originally with some cheap stainless studs that I bought on Amazon and a cheap high speed steel die that I bought on Amazon. And I got about three of these made before the die was completely dull and just started twisting the stud in the collet. So these are mild steel studs from McMaster and a good quality threading die. And then I'm gonna use plenty of cutting oil on here. And we'll just do this by hand. About every turn and a half, I'm backing it up to break the chip. And that's about it. Turn this all the way down, run it in reverse to back this up. And that is an M6 thread on one end and an M5 on the other. Let me make uh, 15 more of these and I'll meet you back over at the machine. Okay, in order to mount the motor in here, we need to get the depth correct on the coupler. Now I was noticing that these couplers have a five millimeter keyway in them and there's a five millimeter keyway in these clear path motors. Uh, it is a clamp on coupler. Do you really need a key in this application? No, of course not. Key is a five millimeter by five millimeter square, 20 millimeters long, and we will just slide that in, put the coupler over it, and then we need to adjust the depth of the coupler on the shaft. And what I'm gonna do is just push it in here, made it up, and then push the motor home. Now pull that out, and we have this now at the right depth for zero clearance. And then I am just going to, with my thumbs here, pull this down maybe half a millimeter, just to make sure that we have a little bit of running clearance in there. And then I will tighten down the clamp. And that should be good to go. Now I'll just take the studs Put those in the holes. Some of these are through holes and some of them bottom out on parts on the other side. Now let's see, which way do I want the wires? I think I want the wires up on this one. And then I'm using little flange nuts with serrated locking surfaces on them. And once I get one of these down, the motor will stay put. Okay, one motor down, three to go. Okay, with the motors mounted, we just need to hook up the rest of the cables and mount all of the end stops. I have the electronics box mounted to the plasma cutting table that's a part of my welding table. It's real nice. I just threaded some holes, bolted it on so I can tilt it up to work on it, tilt it down, it's out of the way. I'm going to have to build a proper stand for this machine at some point in the future, but for now I've just got it on the welding cart getting the proximity sensors all put into place here. These are M12 normally open inductive proximity sensors. That's what Avid sold as a part of their kit. I'm not real happy with that choice. Uh, I kind of didn't realize until I got to this point in the project that this thing is so powerful. I probably want normally closed switches and I probably want ones with a little bit longer actuation distance just so that I have a little more over travel before a crash. And 
I'll probably be addressing that at some point in the future, but these will be sufficient to get the machine homed and running. There are a lot of cables on this machine. You can see for now, I'm just stuffing them in a cardboard box. When this thing has a permanent home on a, you know, some kind of permanent stand, I'll probably try to get cables that are closer to the right length or work out some kind of cable management solution. So that's all the cables for the end stops. I'm coming back with a wrench and adjusting and tightening them down. Get the last of the cables connected. You can see I've got the PC board sitting there on top of the electronics uh, box. That's because I don't actually have labels on the connector panel yet, so I don't know where things go. So I'm actually looking at the silk screen on that spare PC board to figure out which connector is which. Get the computer set up, e-stop switch, and I think we are about ready to give this thing a test run. Now, there are a couple of things that I had to do to, a couple of changes that I had to make. Uh, in the control box, I had it wired originally so that all of the home switches, except for the one on the slave axis or the A axis, uh, they were all wired to separate inputs on the Acorn. And that is supported for homing individual axes, but for auto squaring of a dual drive gantry, as far as I can tell, it simply isn't supported. When I tried, it did not recognize the, what it would be the axis to home okay input. It just didn't recognize that, and it just started backing the axis up and backing it up, trying to clear what it thought was a set home switch. I really don't know. So what I did is I went ahead and gave up and wired all of the home switches in parallel and provided a home input, a home all input to the Acorn. And that seems to be working. I just wagoed the wires together. I will look into it further. I've got a post in the forum. I haven't heard anything back, but I posted it late on a Saturday night. So we'll see if I get a response there. Okay, let's power this thing up. Turn the power on here and all the motors come to life. And I'm gonna give this 10 seconds to make sure that the Acorn has enabled and has a heartbeat. I wish I could wire the heartbeat light outside the box, but I don't know how to do that. Okay, let's we'll start CNC 12 here. That comes up in reset mode and I will clear it. Now, the machine coordinates here are just defaulting to 000, but you can see that the current position is not being displayed because the machine has not yet been homed. But let's jog it around a little bit first. Let's try the x-axis. Okay, that was working. Faster, faster. That's working, why? If it looks like things are wobbling, it's because the welding table doesn't have the feet set. It's just sitting on this caster, so that's gonna wobble around a little bit. Let me bring these back near their home switches. And Z. You can hear the click there. That was the brake releasing when the motor enabled. Bring that near its home switch. And let's go ahead and hit the, uh, hit the cycle start, which will run the automatic homing cycle. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how this works while it's running because the default script actually has a bunch of delays in it and it runs really slowly. So I'll click to start. And the first thing it's gonna do is home Z. And so it's moving this very slowly up until it finds the limit switch or the home switch and then backs off from it. Now it's gonna do the same thing in X. It's gonna to move till it finds the home switch and then back off to clear. Okay, there it goes. And then for the dual gantry, it's gonna drive forward until it finds the home switch on the right side, which is the slave axis, because it's set to hit 25 thou ahead if the gantry's square. So, bunch of delays. Now it's going to move in until it finds this. And then it's going to back off to clear the switch. Again, there's a whole bunch of delays in the default script. Now it's going to unpair the axes and it's going to pull the axis on this side forward to hit the switch, which it just did. 
and now it's going to back it off, and then it's going to back it off a configured amount, another 25 thou, and now it's clear. So what it's doing is the script is, is silly. It's making the assumption that the switch on this side is going to hit first, and that the switch on the, the y-axis side, this is the a-axis, the y-axis side will have to go further to hit. And they recommend setting it up to about 25 thousandths of an inch difference which is what, just over half a millimeter? So it's gonna come forward till it hits this first, back it off, then it's gonna disable this motor. Actually it has to stay enabled so that it'll continue holding position, but it unpairs it and then brings this one in to find the switch, which is actually twisting the gantry out of square, but only by a little bit, and it, it is flexible enough for that. Then it's gonna back it off to clear the switch, and so now it knows that whatever the offset is between these switches, that's how far out of square it is, and so that it'll move back that amount. I set this up and did a bunch of dialing, you know, stepping one thou at a time, watching the lights on the switches, and I know that the switches are 27 thou apart, at least relative to the relaxed position of the gantry. Is the relaxed position of the gantry really square? Eh, I don't actually know, but we'll find out later when we tune this thing up. But then to adjust that, all I have to do is go in the software, and configure the offset, so I'll configure the amount that it backs off after it hits the switch on this side before it repairs everything, and that will then adjust the squareness of the gantry axis. Let me just bring up the wizard here and show you how I have this configured. So we looked at some of this before. The axis drive type is set up for the clear path. And for the input, I now have a home all on the Acorn input number one. Now you generally want these home switches to be on the Acorn itself and not on the Ether 1616 because the expansion board has higher latency and a little bit more jitter than you get with the PLC control built right into the Acorn. So you generally want your homes here. Now I had the X, Y, and Z home and I reluctantly wired it all together on the home all until such time as I can figure out if there's a better way to do it or if I really should just do this, which is what the manual recommends on nearly every page talking about this stuff. And then I have the slaved home input on number four. So then under homing and travel, I have selected I want automatic homing, and down here you set the homing direction. So axis one is set to go negative, that's X, Y, home's negative, which is at the front, and then Z, which is axis three, homes positive, which is at the top. And then I have travel limits set up. The hard limit of the machine is about 26 inches of travel. I have this set to 25 and three quarters, just so that it'll sit about a quarter of an inch off the bumper and off of the over travel limit switch, which should never get hit. And then I have the Z axis set to come down to minus seven inches. We'll see how much reach I really need once the spindle is installed. I might increase this. I think I can go to about eight and three quarters, but right now, because this axis can get all the way over to the side here, if I select Z and bring this down, that extrusion, if I come down too much further, can actually collide with this side piece, and I would like to avoid doing that. Oh, one thing I did miss here on the axis configuration is I have axis two, three, and four set to direction reversal. And that's just because they were moving the wrong direction. Um, I want them to move in the positive direction when it goes positive. I had to reverse these to make that happen. Now on the axis pairing, I have axis four paired to axis two. So axis four is set up for what's commonly called the slave or the A axis. Um, so I have those paired, and then I have automatic access squaring and alignment. So right here is the master access um, squaring and alignment distance, which is set to 25 thou. Um, I'm not sure. I thought that could be configured. It doesn't look configurable here. I'll have to look into that. And then you've got the feed rate for your homing movements. And it shows down here, just as a courtesy, what it thinks is configured for the master axis and the slave axis home switches. So home all on input one and the slave home input on input four. When I had it configured for the three separate inputs, this top one was blank. It just didn't know what it was. 
and I don't believe I touched anything in the advanced tab, so that is all that's there. I'm not going to save this. Let's try moving this thing fast and see what happens. So let me move the, start with the x-axis, and we'll move this all the way over and make sure that that, we'll run this over. I'll do this slowly at first to make sure it's gonna stop. And it does, it's stopping at 25 and three quarters within a tenth. It's because it's a metric screw and inch measurements don't ask. So if I just run this in at full speed, it still stops. Nice. And then Y should do the same. Yep, and that's the hard stop. So let me set, I've already got that set, but set Y to zero, set X to zero, and we've got the Z all the way down. So now over here in the UI, I'm going to say, go to machine, we're at the work coordinate system X, Y, zero. I'll hit go to machine X, Y, zero, and it should raise the Z axis and then come all the way to the front quarter in the machine at maximum rapids. And it just, I just giggle every time it does that. Okay, and then I can also go back to the work coordinate system, X, Y, zero, Z, of course, is already at the top. That was a little bit gut-wrenching the, wrenching the first time it did it. It was a little bit scary, and, but I've been playing with it very, very carefully, um, bringing it up to the stops, going a little bit faster, a little bit faster with my hand on the e-stop switch. And so far, this seems to be very, very well behaved. And I am quite pleased. Uh, this is coming together pretty well. The Z-axis, I think there, it is binding a little bit internally. It is a little bit stiff, but man, that motor has no problem at all. In fact, I did some testing with the X-axis to see if I drive it into the bumper gently, how much will the bumper compress before the motor stalls? And the answer is, it doesn't. The bumper compresses all the way to solid, and then it starts flexing and bending the motor plate. And I'm convinced if I kept pushing it, it would snap the, uh, snap the screws right off of that thing and probably screw it right out the end and drop it on the floor. So we won't be doing that anymore. But uh, yeah, the bumpers are not gonna hold this thing. I've gotta have the limit switches set right and gotta have the travel limits um, because there is just so much power in those motors and this thing can build up so much speed. It's got so much moving mass. I am very impressed with the clear paths. It will be very interesting to see how they work under cutting forces. Uh, I think this is way overkill and it's glorious. Well, that's all I have time for today, but I feel really good about what I've accomplished to date. This was a major milestone actually getting the machine running. You never really know how things are gonna come together until they come together. And so far, I am very pleased. There's still plenty that needs to be done. Obviously, there's no spindle on this machine. I do have a tramming spindle mount. This is the one that Avid makes. It's bolted on here. But per usual, it's not gonna work without modifications for my purposes. To put the FM30F three horsepower ATC spindle on this that I currently have over on my Grizzly, I'm gonna have to drill some new holes and I think it will just fit. It wasn't intended for that, but I think we can make it work. The machine also needs to be dialed in flat and true. I do have a tool coming that we will use for that in a future video. If you follow me on Instagram, you know why that tool isn't here yet. And finally, we need to tune the clear path servos. And with a dual gantry axis, that's a little bit tricky, but pretty straightforward. And we will do that. I'll probably do that as a standalone video just because it's, a, it's something topical that people are gonna wanna search for. So I'll probably do that as a standalone instructional video. And all of that is coming up. If you enjoyed the video, Give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.